Okay, everybody, hello, good afternoon. Uh, the bells of the tower uh, just down the road here where I live is uh, chiming for four o'clock. So we'll start the, the webinar on changing the parking fundamentals. Um, it's a webinar that is uh, uh, organized in by Polis in cooperation with the European Parking Association and the uh, EU funded project uh, Civitas Park for Sump. Uh, and it's part of a series of webinars we call Mobilizing Mobility, where we try to link uh, European transport innovation like it is happening in projects like Park for Sump uh, into local action. And um, you see the series here on the screen. Some of you might have participated in other webinars. So we have uh, twice a week a, a meeting of uh, of experts uh, to discuss various topics on uh, in urban mobility. Um, today we are a bit uh, off the normal time frame of the two o'clock uh, start. We start at four o'clock uh, to allow uh, Benjamin Clark of the um, University of Oregon to, to take part in the webinar. As you know, the time difference uh, is quite heavy, so we're very happy that Benjamin is here. Uh, and we're also, I, I hope you can appreciate the fact that we, um, uh, that we have now been, uh, that we are now uh, starting at, at four o'clock. Uh, a couple of pointers for the meeting. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. That means that you also can uh, enjoy the webinar afterwards. Um, please do mute all your microphones and you can use the, the Q&A box uh, to, uh, to write questions. I will have a, a look at that uh, regularly uh, to, um, uh, to pick up questions that I can uh, dispatch to the, to the speakers. A um, couple of words about uh, Park for Sump. It's a unique project. It's unique because there's almost no research at European level about parking. And Park for Sump is an innovation action looking at the topic. Um, it is a game changer for urban mobility because we are uh, integrating uh, high quality parking management into sustainable urban mobility planning. Um, parking is often overseen in SUMPs and Park for Sump uh, wants to change that. Um, you see here the whole consortium on a map. Uh, we work with, uh, with 16 cities in uh, various contexts of different sizes, uh, different legal contexts, diff different capacities. Um, and we work on, on better quality, on very specific measures in parking, uh, all with the idea to uh, create better cities and also, um, yeah, think in a, in a strategic way of parking as part of urban mobility systems. I'm not going to read the, the full list of uh, objectives we, we have, but the, it is clear we want to move from reaction um, to uh, strategic parking policies. Uh, and for that purpose, we have an, uh, a tool called ParkPad, um, which the coordinator might say a couple of words uh, about at the end of the, the webinar, Patrick, Aurex is here to draw some conclusions on behalf of, uh, of Park for Sump. Uh, but we also have an, uh, uh, a lot of material published, for instance, a, a practitioner's briefing on parking and SUMPs uh, as part of the, um, the Sump guidelines that are uh, produced under uh, endorsement of the European Commission. We had a lot of discussion about the, the tone of the webinar, also with European Parking Association, um, about why we have called the webinar uh, changing the parking fundamentals. And um, a little bit in the back of our minds, there are very big, drastic changes, big disruptions arriving to urban mobility. Um, with timelines that start to uh, coincide with timelines we talk about when we build new buildings in cities, when we build parking infrastructures in cities. I gathered here a number of um, timelines for automation of vehicles, driverless cars. Um, don't look at them because they're all wrong, most likely. Uh, but even the most pessimistic uh, timelines saying like, okay, by 2070, there will be 
a form of um, of automation on our roads, uh, maybe not even in cities, but but there will be automated functions in in vehicles all or vehicles on our streets. Um, if you look at um, 2020, 2070, it's 50 years from now. And I must say that I, if I go to town here in my beautiful city of Leuven, if I would go by car, it is likely that I would park in a, in a building that has been built 30, 40, 50 years uh, ago. So these timelines start to coincide with decisions we are making about how our cities are looking now eh, and what we build now. Um, so fundamental changes on different levels uh, in infrastructures. And we have um, Martina Hertel who will talk about that aspect of, of the fundamental changes um, in services, uh, in mobility services. And we have Benjamin Clark who will talk about that. And also in, in management, um, how do we approach vehicles in our streets? Um, and we have um, Hervé Le Vif from uh, Paris and we have uh, Benjamin from Berlin uh, to talk about these, uh, these different management approaches. Um, so the need for speed has changed to a need for space. Um, and we also see a lot of new use cases for, for public space and we, and we need to uh, accommodate these and uh, parking is an important, um, plays an important role because there is a service industry uh, surrounding parking, an industry that's also under uh, transformation. Um, and we also are used to make money of parking, of course, and that's something we would like to continue uh, in the future. Um, so let's see where, all these uh, fundamental changes will go to, and that's a bit the framework of the uh, of the workshop this afternoon. Um, this is the speaker lineup. Um, we start with Theo, who, on behalf of EPA, uh, being the innovation managing director for Q Park, uh, will say a couple of words to uh, to welcome us also to this webinar. Theo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ivo, for these uh, kind words and uh, um, <clears throat> hello to everybody. Thanks for, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thanks for the invitation to say a, a couple of uh, welcoming words on behalf of the EPA and, and QPARC at the start of this webinar, Mobilizing Mobility. Uh, EPA uh, works uh, very close together in co-creating and promoting sustainable mobility solutions with POLIS and, and Park for SEMP. Uh, today, uh, the EPA represents the national associations of uh, 22 countries in Europe uh, and their 40 million on and off uh, street parking spaces with almost uh, 500,000 uh, professionals and an estimated annual uh, revenue of 23 billion uh, euros, taking care for parking of all kinds of vehicles. I mention it uh, again, parking of all kinds of uh, vehicles. And uh, we are looking uh, and we are uh, uh, triggered by, by new business models uh, in the near future. So we are in a transition period, just what Evo has already uh, uh, said, not only by COVID-19, but driven by the demands uh, of citizens and visitors who wants to live, enjoy and stay in better cities with more open and public green spaces and car free uh, inner cities. Uh, Ivo mentioned already uh, the, uh, the different initiatives about shared use mobility zones. Um, zero emission mobility for, uh, for all eh, is the central theme uh, this, this week. And as a parking industry, we have the obligation to contribute to these, uh, to these new developments. Uh, less car trips in the city centers. Eh? We, we, we are the first, in the first year, we're announcing this now so openly, less car trips in the city centers, more biking and walking safely facilitated, less on-street parking capacity, better usage of the existing off-street capacities, transforming these car parks uh, where possible into mobility hubs, where we are able to promote cleaner transport, more electric mobility and shared mobility services, uh, and improving the uh, EV charging infrastructure. But 
differentiate between cities in size and economic functions. Metropolitan cities like Paris, Berlin, and London need other sustainable mobility concepts than medium-sized and smaller cities. The majority of the cities in Europe have less than 200,000 inhabitants, where the car is still important uh, in, um, in the new urban transport uh, arena. Uh, take also care for all the customer groups. Be inclusive. That will be the, the theme of, uh, of the next week uh, webinar. Be inclusive, taking care for elderly people, disabled people, families with young children and, and business travelers, which are still more than, uh, from our point of view, 60% of all the uh, travelers uh, in, in cities. Uh, use the digital capabilities more efficiently, sustainable mobility solutions are also connected solutions. Looking for integrated solutions, integrating parking into dynamic urban management. Park for Sump, uh, headed by Patrick, has presented last January a very nice brochure, Good Reasons and Principles for Parking Management, which we, which we have undersigned, uh, the whole industry has undersigned these, um, these uh, reasons and principles, because it shows that parking management as part of the sustainable urban mobility plans is very effective with low, relatively low investments, which could be implemented very fast. So we could have the results on a relatively short term. So thank you very much for having the opportunity to say a couple of words and uh, success with the exciting presentations this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Theo. Very much appreciated. Uh, we'll share the uh, the link to the brochure also in the in the, the chat so that uh, people can can visit that. And I must say, I was also really happy when I saw the uh, Q Park uh, mailing saying that Q Park is in for the Mobility Week. Uh, that's really an, uh, a big uh, a big change of mindset. I think uh, that's really great to to see. Okay, uh, we move to the first speaker, which is uh, Martina Hertel. I will stop sharing my screen, uh, Martina, and then you can uh, share your screen. Uh, Martina is uh, working for the German Institute for Urban uh, Issues um, or Urbanism, uh, and she is a uh, a loyal partner in uh, Park for Sump, uh, and she has developed uh, uh, the framework for um, building standards and parking in the project, and she will present that uh, now. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. you. Um, I think I have to go to Bildschirm Bildschirm? Presentation, Bildschirm. and then I, uh, okay. yeah, I will mute myself, so the floor is yours. Do you see the uh, presentation? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thanks Ivo and thanks uh, Theo for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Well, um, I'm going to talk about the changing the parking offers by parking standards. Um, as Ivo introduced our Park for Some project, uh, parking standards is one of the field of activities in that project. Uh, you may know parking standards as parking requirement, parking norms, it varies in several languages. Uh, parking standards usually regulate how much space uh, is needed for parking in new buildings. And it depends very much on the size of the new development. It can be designed for the amount of apartments or the size of apartments and about how many offices you're going to have, uh, how many shops, how many restaurant places. Parking standards are an important steering instrument for urban and transport uh, planning because you can, as Ivo said, design what will happen in the future. Um, why do we have parking standards? Well, originally uh, they were introduced to keep the streets free for the flowing traffic um, and to prevent when you have a new location, a new uh, development, that the new development uh, will generate parking problem in, in its neighborhood. 
So um, in most countries, you have minimum requirements and developers can build as much parking spaces as they want to. Um, the legal situation varies uh, a lot throughout Europe. That's typical Europe. You can see on the left hand side. More or less, you can say for um, development in or building developments, you have like 1.0 uh, parking spaces per housing project per residential unit. Um, if you look to like uh, suburban areas or even rural area, this is may, maybe higher there you have a ratio of 1.5 or maybe two. Um, for shopping malls and all that, um, it's even much more. The picture um, on the right hand side is from the US, so uh, Benjamin may can comment on that later on. Well, um, um, yeah. The problem with parking standards is that they may induce car ownership because when you make um, car parking very easy, it's very likely um, that uh, you're going to use your car because study shows that the availability, the location, the distance and the comfort of parking uh, really affects how much uh, you, you will use your car. So, and anyway, how much parking space would be enough? Like if you look to um, the, the life cycle of a typical household uh, or a family household, uh, they start as a couple with a car. And then when the children are still small, then one car is enough. And with the time, sort of this is changing and um, it couldn't, could end up like with three or four cars per household. So, uh, and in the end, no car is needed anymore. So how much is the best ratio? So you could argue, well, then build the most as you can, but this doesn't work out because building car spaces is really expensive. If you look to like um, parking on street level, it's between 3,000 uh, euros up to when you have to dig up um, and build parking garages, you end up like uh, with um, 70,000 uh, euros per parking space. Um, there's a general rule or the thumb rule. Um, you can say like building a parking garage costs about like at least 10% of the building costs uh, you're gonna use. And um, the problem is that even if you have tenants afterwards who are not gonna use uh, a, a car or have a car like in a, in a residential area, um, they have to pay for the, for the parking as well. And so this is a little bit unfair. Um, so how are you going to, or how do we deal parking standards in the future? Well, these high requirements to build the fixed parking standards affect the construction and maintenance cost, as I pointed out before. And so you have like um, building up more and more parking spaces uh, on the, in the residential areas need parking spaces at the other end as well. And it sort of uh, works or it creates severe environmental problems as well. So you have actually, well, um, the municipalities actually have three options. Um, they can abolish parking standards, say no minimum requirements in the hope nobody will build them. But this doesn't turn out to be a good practice. My colleague uh, from Berlin, Benjamin, may, can uh, um, underline this later on, um, because that what, what was happening in Berlin. Um, the second choice you have is lower parking or those minimum requirements when you have good access to other uh, forms of mobility and the best solution is fix a minimum parking uh, allowance, car parking allowance. So as for instance, Zurich did. 
When I said uh, you can lower your minimum requirements for car parking if uh, alternatives are available, I was thinking about like when you have really good public transport, um, when you have car sharing in the area, when you have really high good quality um, parking facilities for bicycles. And on the right hand side, you see a picture from Graz. They have mobility contracts. Um, and this is a form, a legal, very important legal form, how you can fix it, uh, that not too many park spacing, uh, park spaces are, uh, were gonna build. What is really, really important is um, the really necessary precondition for all that is that you have paid parking or regulated parking in the area where you knew new development is gonna happen. Uh, because if there is no paid parking outside, everyone will park in the street and then you have a really problems with your neighborhood. So um, you have to give a legal chance for the developers uh, to lower the minimum uh, for car parking if available are available. So this is a picture of the city of Mainz, uh, where the, how this could look like, where you have a certain area where you get a so-called public transport bonus. And on the right hand side, you see a picture from Freiburg. Um, one city in our um, consortium is the city of Umeå. It's in the northern part of Sweden. And that's what they did. They sort of removed all the parking spaces, the on-street parking spaces into an off-street parking garage. And the new development had to build their new um, parking garages or parking space there as well. And this is the way how the whole thing worked financially as well. And what they did is they had like, um, they don't have parking in, in the streets, but they have like uh, bicycle parking and um, yeah, street life. Um, the good practice from Graz is, as I said, mobility contracts. And they designed, uh, or the de developers has to sign a contract. And what we've done is a really nice video, which you can can find on our website, on the Park for Some website, and you find more details on that on the website. Well, um, there are quite a number of good examples uh, in big cities where they have maximum parking allowance, uh, where they fixed the uh, um, amount of parking spaces which were allowed to build. And the best example is Zurich, as I said, but you find those um, uh, examples as well in London, Paris, Graz, Krakow, Edinburgh, Amsterdam, Ljubljana, and a few more. And we have a German example as well in uh, Freiburg, Vauban, uh, where they have uh, built the parking not uh, nearby but sort of in a certain distance and in sort of like um, collective garages and they were connected with a um, not um, financial burden um, they people had to put money in and the the parking garage could uh, build could be built later um, so yeah, the ratio in, in freiburg verbin is just by um, 0 0.0 uh, cars per housing unit. This is very, very uh, much lower than the 1.0 I was pointing out before. Uh, so to summarize and to give you something to take home, um, if the car is the closest mean of transportation at your home, um, and you're gonna find uh, parking spaces at the final uh, at your final destination. You're going to end up to use your car, um, and it's gonna be your first choice. Um, and this is creating um, uh, parking demands on the other end of the travel uh, at your workplace, at shopping centers, and leisure facilities. Um, so um, parking standards. Um, they 
are really um, an important part of the whole uh, toolbox and it's very important for munici municipalities to play with that and this should not give in out of hand. High requirements, as I said, uh, affect construction and uh, maintenance costs. The parking standards uh, should give the uh, option to lower the requirements uh, when you have good transportation alternatives. Ideally, um, maximum parking allowance are fixed and limit how much parking is provided in new buildings. Um, Zurich, for instance, I've pointed out uh, several times, they have in the inner part by a 0 0.1 only. So that's really, really strict. Um, what you should fix in your parking requirements or your parking standards is minimum standards for high quality bicycle parking facilities. That's very, very important. Um, in, in Belgium, I think it's uh, Saint Nicolas where they have just one, um parking bicycle parking uh space for each pillow in your house so that's a really good ratio on that and most important is you should integrate regulation about parking standards uh in your sump and and the whole discussion about your sump so thank you very much for your intention and i will join the rest of the seminar so i'm here for any questions by you thank you martina um, i have a couple of um, mm -hmm. comments from the um, i'll turn on my my camera also uh, from the the chat we have an, uh, a couple of comments about uh, uh, standards where olivier Asselin from from lille also the the parking working group chair of police uh, where he says okay there in in france it's actually um, there are for housing uh, it's not allowed to have uh, maximas um, and we'll we can might hear from hervé also from paris uh, his his, uh, his his view on that uh, we have Dirk Lauers um, who says that uh, sometimes uh, the uh, the minimums are really high like in antwerp um, 1.8 per apartment and we also have a, a comment from uh, Vienna where it uh, is uh, one parking spot 400 um, square meters uh, apartment um, and then a, a question maybe as a uh, for you um, from I will try to rephrase what what Dirk asks um, so what is it best to have a minimum or a maximum per area uh, and then fix it per project uh, depending on the mobility profile of the users um, because different functions might require different parking needs um, so maybe a mobility norm instead of a parking norm that's what it's currently under discussion in Flanders yep. mm -hmm. any comments on that yep. yeah I, I would definitely agree on that that you sort of like have a more a mobility approach to it than the parking approach mm -hmm. Um, and um, I think you, w w the best way is coming up with different zones. I mean, uh, if you look like um, to suburban areas, uh, you will have or you will uh, end up with different um, different situation or you need different uh, standards that in the inner city. So I think uh, you definitely have to um, a zoning model which should be li a little bit flexible and um, I think the idea to start uh, with projects first and then to fix it in your legal documents is quite a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay and then last uh, last question um, the um, the question uh, do we coming from Frank Wefering um, asking like okay you have Vauban as a, as a leading example but are there other uh, Vauban style, uh, style cases that you've come across in, in your uh, in the study? Yeah. Um, well we have like um, the um, um, 
uh, Darmstadt is um, one other German city. They have 0 0.5 um, um, as parking ratio right now. Uh, it's called Lincoln CD, uh, um, uh, Lincoln um, uh, development. Um, and uh, there are several um, all over Europe. I don't know the exact ratio for every uh, development, but there are sort of several spots. Um, the reason why Freiburg is part of Park for Some is they have a really new development called Dietenbach, and they want to have a low ratio there although um, they know they're sort of a bit um, far away from the center. It, take, it will take about 15 minutes to get there. Um, and, but nevertheless, they want to try to realize a ratio between um, 0.5 and 0 0.7. Um, so um, it's very low for this kind of development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also in the Netherlands, you have Utrecht as a case, uh, which has an entire uh, city district with also very uh, low uh, low numbers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Olivier, I, I'm not forgetting your question, but I'm uh, keeping that for the, uh, the end discussion, um, because we have to move on to the next uh, next speaker, which, which is Hervé Leviv from uh, Paris. Um, I would like to ask you to stop sharing your screen, Martina, so that yeah. Hervé can step in. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, who has followed a little bit uh, urban mobility in Europe the past months uh, is aware that uh, uh, the current mayor of, um, of Paris, uh, Madame Hidalgo, was also the previous mayor. And she actually has been rewarded by the, the voters for the choices she has made on mobility and she has entered the elections with the concept of the 15 minute city um, which also has implications for the use of, of urban space uh, and it's that story that uh, Hervé will uh, will share with us. Hervé the floor is yours. Yes thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, you are seeing my screen I guess so um, my job is now uh, I'm in charge of, uh, of um, organizing a big consultation in Paris that we will have on, on uh, public space and, and on the place of, of parking on streets and off streets in, in Paris. So the idea is that um, uh, Mayor Hidalgo, when she has been elected, has put in her program that we will make a lot of vegetalization, will um, um, increase the number of bicycle lanes and so on. And as public space is quite um, finished in Paris, the only place we have today to, to put more new function in public space is the place where we, we park cars today. So the idea is to have a big consultation about about this topic, consultation which will occur in, in November and, and December. Uh, maybe just as a quick introduction, um, I, I, I'm sure most of you know Paris, but it's it's some some figures because it's a very dense area. Paris, it's it's 100 square kilometers, but with 20,000 inhabitants per per square kilometer, so it's very very dense. The the number of cars um, owned by Parisian people is quite low today. It's something like uh, uh, only 38 or 35 percent of households which has one car or more, but but more. Uh, it's very seldom that that households have have more than one car. And it's also a city where you can use very, very easily public transport, car sharing, free floating, and so on. So you don't really need a car for for day-to-day -day trip, uh, 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 only if you are going uh, far in the suburbs or, or, or in, in, uh, in uh, or during the night or so on, but it's it's not mandatory to, to use a, a car daily in, uh, in Paris. And maybe uh, another another point is that there is a lot of spaces for parking underground, but a lot of these spaces are quite empty today. And and we have starting to 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 shift some some entire level of 
parking lots in other function that than, than only parking. For example, we have some um, uh, green area, we have sports equipment in some, in some parking lots because we, we, we don't have enough people inside. So um, my presentation is quite short uh, because as we don't have started this consultation, it's difficult to, to, to go to the conclusion. But the, 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 the point is that the number of, of spaces for uh, parking cars is um, reducing uh, since years now in Paris. What you have here is the, the, the first block is the situation in 2005. So you can see that if you want to park private cars, the number of, uh, of spaces was, was this one. And it was split by uh, paid parking um, open to both visitors and residents. And you have also some of them which are open only to visitors. Uh, visitors don't pay too much for, for parking cars in streets. It's roughly uh, 1.5 uh, euro per day. So it's, it's quite cheap for, for a car that you can, you can leave uh, during one week long. And we know today that about 30% of, of, of the car places on street are, are used by, by uh, residents which do, doesn't move the week. So in, in 2005, we, you have also some free space in Paris and of, of course some, some places for disabled people. We have facilities for commercial vehicle with the delivery base, with coaches, and, and with uh, uh, some place in front of banks or supermarket for cash transport only. And some places for parking, private bicycle or motorcycle. We have reduced the number of, of places for private car and, and mainly the debate every day is, is people uh, yelling, saying, uh, it's too expensive, we don't have, have, have places for cars and so on. So, so it's true because we have, we have reduced the number for, for, for parking cars, but what we can see also is that we have increased the number of, of uh, uh, places dedicated to shared system of mobility. For example, we have Velib, we have uh, free floating, we have car sharing places. And we have also um, increased a lot the number of places for motorcycle and, and bicycle. So what we can say is that we have reduced the number of uh, spaces dedicated to cars, but with these uh, places uh, which has been freed from, from cars, we, are, we have put in place a lot of um, places which are uh, used by more people because when you look at this resident, which doesn't move his, his car during the week, which is, which is using one place for one people during one week, for, with the VELIP system, you, you can have uh, 200 people using the same place to, to, to move during the week. So um, now with uh, the, the COVID period and with uh, the, the election period, we, we have changed a lot in very few months. For example, in Paris, we have put in place 50 kilometers of new cycle lanes. And you can see on, uh, on this that previously there, there was some parking place here, so which has been removed. The same for this kind of terrace, with, which has been placed um, on, on parking spaces. And the authorization is today given until next June, June 21, uh, to, to um, restaurant owner to, to keep this space for free uh, for, for as a terrace. We have, this is quite new, uh, since September we have, we have closed some road to traffic in front of school uh, because of problem of, of um, security, because of problem of uh, air quality and so on. And today we have also removed a lot of parking spaces in front of the, of the schools. We are starting to implement on street some um, boxes for for parking bicycle so it's quite new and we have a plan of 60 box uh, by the end of, of this year we have also a program of uh, of selected collector like this you when you can put your your rubbish uh, and and 700 will be installed since uh, in in, 12, in 18 months 
And we have also a very, very big program of vegetalization. You can see on, on this street, for example, that, that 40 years ago, it was like this with, with parks, with car parks, both sides of the road. And, and now you, are, you have um, some vegetalization on, on one side. And we have a, a program of, uh, of uh, 170,000 trees to be planted before, before the end of the, of the new period for Anil Elgo, which is very, very, a very big number of, of, of trees to, to be planted. So today, the, the, the consultation will be focused on, on mainly two questions. The, the first question will be, what do we do with on-street parking? Um, if, if, we, if we follow what, what Anne Hidalgo uh, promised during the campaign, she said that we could get rid of 60,000 car spaces uh, by the end of the year. This means that we will, be, we will reduce by two the, the, the capacity of, of, of um, uh, car parking on streets by, by the end of the period. So the question of, of the consultation will be who needs to, to park on streets and, and what kind of priori priority do we give? Do, do we store cars? Do we, do we more focus on, on, on cars which are moving every day or, or the other way of, of uh, of mobility, it's a, it's a question. And question two is what do we want on street? And this is the question we will, we will ask to Parisian people if they prefer some vegetalization, some, some social activities, some greenings and so on and so on. So the consultation will be held on, on November. And if I focus on, on, on these two questions, on the parking issue, one of the questions will be um, how do we better use off-street parking? Because I, I was mentioning that, that all the underground uh, parking facilities are not used as much as it could be. You can see that on-street, the, the capacity on street is only 17% of the, of the total capacity of, uh, of Paris. You have 8% which are public uh, parking which are belonging to the city of Paris, 10% which are uh, off-street parking belonging to the private sectors, and you have a lot of um, places below, below um, uh, housing which today are sometimes used with, with some, uh, some hubs which are quite new, but, but there is a lot of places which could, could be used uh, more, more than today. There is a question about uh, resident cars because, uh, as I was saying, most of them don't doesn't move during the week. And you can see on, on this map uh, there has been a calculation of on uh, based on the number of cars owned by people, the the capacity of the streets of parking some 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 cars and the capacity of the of the underground to to store some cars also and what you can see on on green is all the places where all the 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 cars belonging to residents could be stores underground and so we have some problems here but in this area also you have some a lot of people uh, with a high number of cars because this is the, the, the most wealthy part of, of Paris. And another question is, is what do we do with motorcycle? Uh, it has been um, a strong debate last winter when, when, when some opponent to Mayor Hidalgo proposed to, to, to make them pay the, their parking because today it's, it's completely free. So it's a real question that we will, uh, we will uh, ask during this consultation. Um, should motorcycle pay? I, I, I'm, I'm sure the answer will be yes. And how much do, do they have to pay for parking on the street? The question on, on public space is, is that uh, we, we now tr start to, to implement uh, some object on street um, instead of cars. So cars were not very nice, but it's not nice to have a, a street with a lot of, of car st stores in it, but it's also not very nice when we, when we put all these different objects. So the question will be what, what, what the image we want to give to, to the streets of Paris and, and how do we control uh, every object that we will put in, in public space. 
And last question is, is a very French question, sorry, but uh, as there is some, some uh, French, French people, uh, they, may, they may help me, is that in, in, in English, you have this uh, word cup side, which is very useful because cup sides means all the space between the pedestrian area and, and, the, and the traffic area. In, in, in French, we don't have the same, and we usually, the, the term bond de stationnement, which could be translated as parking area. So in the mind of, of, of all people, this bond de stationnement is somewhere dedicated to, to parking. So we, we would like to, 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 to name our consultation in another way than, than the future of the bond, the stationnement, but, but something which is more like curbside. So if, you are, if you've got any idea, we, 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 we will be happy to, to hear them. Thank you. OK, thank you, Hervé. And uh, I think you should offer something like a, a bottle of cognac or uh, something that people get when they get the best word for you. But uh, I leave that up to you to, to decide if there's an, a reward uh, for the best word for, um, for curbside in, in, in French. Um, we have a, a couple of very interesting comments also in the, in the chat and questions. Uh, the first is a practical question from Vienna, from Alexander. How did Paris measure the number of parking spaces in private garages? You, it, you show in your graph that yeah. it's a very high share of uh, uh, 65 percent I, I think um is that based on on um on, it's based on, on, on building of, permits uh, or um, yes on building yeah. permit and, and, and also on fiscal or mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. tax tax uh, files and we we can we, by by interrogating this tax file we can we can we know people who paid for for private parking Okay, I, I remember from Brussels, for instance, who wanted to know that also that they really had uh, issues with accessing paper archives yeah. uh, of building permits and also the idea to go and count uh, because people might not report uh, honestly about what, what they have uh, when you ask about it. So it's, it's a complex is, issue. But uh, in addition, there is also a, that a, you a, yeah. yeah, in addition, there is also a, sur a survey at um, uh, this time because uh, you know for for uh, installing EV charging some some um, uh, electricity supplier are very interested to know what is the capacity of, of this private uh, parking to 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 install some mm -hmm. some EV so there is, they are making some survey and when we may get the, the information also yeah yeah and then uh, having a quick quick look at the uh, at the chat uh, yeah there is some conclusion in the chat also about uh, Martina's uh, presentation um, there is an interesting question uh, understanding a bit the evolution of car ownership um, is it similar than in the rest of France are the numbers going up or down uh, how does it look for, for the city? Uh, it is, the decreasing is true in Paris and, and in the very close suburbs uh, I don't remember for for the the other part of the suburb when, when what we call Grand Couronne, which is uh, something like 20 kilometers from the center of Paris. I don't remember if, if it's stable or, or it's something around around zero, maybe a little bit plus or, or less. I don't remember. But but the the, the and, and for other cities and, and big cities in France, I don't know very well. Sorry. And a question from Robert: uh, Do you um, uh, do you the, the solutions that you have seen uh, that you have uh, proposed for the use of the, the space that is freed up is actually uh, static or fixed solutions? Eh? So, do you also have dynamic use in mind of the new? Yeah, yeah, it could be. We we not know really, but uh, uh, for example, uh, we we can sometimes close a road to traffic for in order that the children can play on it. So uh, it means that for uh, for example, uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon or Saturday afternoon, roads could be closed and and, and cars removed from parking, just to leave the uh, the place for children. It's an idea that we have. Uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, we'll come back to another of couple of, of questions if there's time at the end. Uh, Hervé, do read the chat also. You have access to that. There are yeah. some good suggestions. Okay, I will, I will uh, really more in the creative <laughs> sphere, as uh, more on the process side of the of the of the decision than also, but actually the uh, the, the choice of, of words. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. 
the um, so we'll we'll come back to to some of the questions also Florence for instance but we turn now to uh, Benjamin Sternkopf in Berlin um, yes, hello hello Benjamin I was actually uh, I, we were uh, we were all in in our little uh, sustainable mobility bubble uh, there, this summer there was a lot to do about uh, SUVs in um, in in because the growth of number of SUVs in in traffic is is immense uh, and there were ideas also surrounding Berlin or other German cities to to start taxing uh, or start charging parking on the basis of vehicle size it's an, uh, an, a proposal that also for instance uh, Dirk Lauers has, has made in the past in, in, in Belgium also here in the uh, uh, present in the chat um, but you will talk about uh, other other measures uh, that the city is taking and specifically the uh, the measures how you see the relation between parking and air quality uh, planning so uh, benjamin the, the floor is yours yeah, thanks uh, thanks for the invitation um, i'm happy to participate at the webinar um, as Ivo already said, my name is Benjamin Sternkopf and I work for the Senate Department for the Environment, Transport and Climate Protection of Berlin. And uh, my field of expertise is the linkage between air quality planning and transport planning. And we try to uh, prioritize um, measures from transport planning to identify them to, uh, to get to a better air quality. And yeah, that's the presentation about. I want to give you an insight into the air quality plan of Berlin and show you the linkage between air quality and parking management. And I want to show you why, uh, why parking management is one of the main measures at the air quality plan in Berlin. But um, first of all, let's have a look at the uh, uh, traffic trend of Berlin. As you can see on the right-hand chart, um, the traffic is decreasing in Berlin for the last 20 years. So we have less car traffic, about 15%, something like this, since 2011, it's stable. And the truck traffic, it's, um, it's also very stable. But instead of uh, better air quality, we, when we look at the measures, measurements uh, for air quality, we see, you might see it here, the, the red line, which is uh, NO2. It's, it's very stable and it's above the uh, limit value for NO2. So there was no, um, no there were no better uh, technical measures for better air quality. Also we had a decrease of traffic um, um, the air quality is still bad and you might know it as the diesel scandal where um, the um, engines uh, emitted uh, too much NO2 and this is what we see here at the measurements. So um, it was clear that we needed extra measures, not only technical measures with the new air quality plan and um, that's why we passed a new air quality plan last year in Berlin. And I want to show you the, um, the model or the scheme for this uh, air quality plan. Right now we have uh, an exceedance of the limit values at 117 road sections. And we have three levels of intervention. The, um, the first level of intervention are the citywide measures, which are uh, focused on the uh, mobility behavior to change the mobility behavior. And as you can see, parking management is one of the uh, citywide measures. And on the other hand, the pull measure is uh, to improve public, public transport. Um, there was an update in the price scheme, for example, for commuters, it's now cheaper and for pupils and poor people. And these were the citywide measures. On, uh, on second level, we had uh, measures along heavily trafficked routes because we saw that there are uh, roads with much cars and we, um, we implemented speed limits on, this, on these roads and did, uh, some uh, 
amendments of the traffic management and the traffic light system. So we could, uh, could decelerate traffic there and improve the air quality. And the last level of intervention were the bans for diesel cars, which were a big discussion before um, the last two or three years before. And um, we also discussed about implementing new pedestrian zones or bicycle roads, but in the end um, they came, but not because of the air quality plan, but because of uh, the Corona crisis. So, um, Let's have a closer look at, at the measure large scale parking management in Berlin. As you can see, um, the coverage of, uh, of um, parking management in the Berlin city center is pretty low uh, compared to international cities or other cities in Germany. We have like a, like a patchwork of, uh, of some zones of parking management. And there is only 35% last year, which is under parking management. And our plan was to, uh, to double this area within two years from 35 to 75% and to have a whole coverage of the city center, which is 88 square kilometers by 2023. Well, one of the main problems there is that um, the the goals are set by by the state level, but the operation and implementation of these no, new uh, parking zones are done by the districts. So uh, these districts are doing on their own. They have their own government and they have their own administration and it isn't said that if the sales level wants the districts to do so um, that they do and um, this is one of the problems we're tackling right now. Um, it was not only the area we wanted to expand also um, there was there should be an update in the pricing system. Last year we had the um, uh, we had um, uh, written down in the air quality plan that um, the pricing will be uh, updated from in every uh, stage from uh, from one to two euros per hour, two to three euros and three to four euros per hour. And uh, despite of the dis despite of the decision last year to um, uh, to have higher prices right now, there's a new political discussion going on, and I'm not sure if we if we will have the regulation, even if it is written down in a binding um, urban development plan. So, uh, one other problem we have with the uh, with the expansion of of parking management is that. Um, the prices for resident parking are very low. So it's in Berlin, it's only 10 euros per year for resident parking. So we might have rebound effects with the parking management because for a resident, it becomes more attractive to use car because they have uh, less commuters coming from, from the outskirts. So more free parking space uh, might have uh, some rebound effect. So this is one thing where we have to focus and I will come to back this later. But uh, let me show you some uh, some expected effects of the uh, of the parking management on traffic. Um, we had we had a uh, um, external surveyor who has reviewed uh, all the different measures for us um, and uh, one of the um, results of, of this review was that um, parking management is one is considered as one of the most effective measures to decrease traffic and with the decrease of traffic it will also decrease emissions not only air quality but also noise and uh, carbon dioxide and also uh, it will help to um, for a better road safety. Um, so uh, overall, we we hope and we think that um, 
the um, introducing the um, large-scale parking management for this whole city area of Berlin uh, will help to decrease the emissions by about 5% here, which helps us to uh, come below um, the air quality limit values in in most of the road sections where we have uh, an exceedance right now. Um, what are the current challenges in our expansion of the um, parking management? As I already said, um, one of the main problems is that we have two levels of government and administration in Berlin. Uh, which means that we have um, 12 districts uh, who are uh, which are doing on their own and which uh, which are financed by uh, by the state level to um, to expand the parking management but in some in some districts um, other political parties are in power then on state level and they have other goals, other focus. So um, there is no no real force to uh, to push them to introduce parking management. Then also there's a political dissent on parking policy. It's not it's not a real consent right now. We have it written down in in urban development plans and in air quality plans. And um, if you read the plans, you could think, well, there's a consent about uh, expanding parking management. But if you have the small regulations itself and um, the expansion in the districts and, for example, the regulation for higher prices, there uh, comes a political dissent, dissent every time up, um, which makes it hard to have uh, uh, a straight way to, to introduce parking management. Um, the third and fourth problem is that um, the schedule is pretty ambitious, but uh, right now we still have the after effects of austerity policy in Berlin because 15 years ago, Berlin was a poor city and we had high staff cuts in administration and uh, especially on a district level, there are still two, there, there's two less staff. Berlin is also um, growing. We have 40,000 people a year coming here and um, and the staff is not enough to do the expansions. The fourth problem is that there's no upper limit, as Martina already said, for uh, parking lots or parking space in private buildings. So this means that we can regulate parking policy on, on uh, public parking spaces, but uh, um, we have no power to regulate it or right now we have no regulations to um, for example to set the prices or to decrease um, uh, parking space in private buildings so these are the problems but um, there are also some good news uh, one of the good news is that we could convince the uh, federal government uh, in germany to increase the prices for or the fines for parking without um, without a ticket. It's, it was very low five years ago or 10 years ago, it was only five euros, then it was increased to 10 euros. And now we're about 20 euros. And I hope in maybe two years, we are about 40 euros. But right now we are at 20 euros. And this also, this already helps um, that we need less staff to control it or um, that people um, paying for, for, a, for a ticket. Um, the second thing is that there was, surprisingly, there was a change in, in federal law. Um, the, um, before there was a price limit for resident parking, you couldn't increase the, uh, the price for vignettes or the permissions for uh, resident parking higher than 30 euros per year. But now it's abolished and, and this gives uh, the power to the state level to introduce new uh, pricing models for resident parking. And this was something I wanted to uh, discuss with you because as Ivo already said, um, now it's, it's not 
in the uh, political discussion right now, but we want to have a political discussion about it that we might could um, uh, introduce a, a pricing scheme which um, which tackles the problems, the environmental problems we have with uh, with parking and cars in cities. So, for example, in Berlin, the um, the number of cars increased um, the last 10 years by about 100,000 cars and the cars become heavier um, and what, by becoming heavier, they are emitting more CO2, more NO2, they have higher noise uh, emissions. And if we, uh, if we bring this together, for example, the vehicle length or the vehicle weight with, uh, with vineyard prices, we would have an instrument uh, to, uh, yeah, to to solve this problem. So uh, this is in in my opinion, or in opinion of the environmental department, uh, uh, a thing would one could introduce here in Berlin. But as I said already, um, it's not in a political discussion right now, but we want to have a political discussion. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the, my question is, um, is uh, the, the vignette, would you talk about uh, in the last slide, that is about an, a resident permit or it's yes, just yeah. a vignette to enter Berlin as a no no, no it's a, it's no, a yeah. resident vignette yeah, yeah, permit. Yeah. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um the other question I have which is a bit in line with what Dirk Lauers is asking about uh, how uh, you have uh, modeled um the um uh, how, what an, kind of analysis you have made to to come to these results uh, and a sensitivity analysis or not my question is also the the how is the the relation between air quality people and community with their tools, so with their modeling tools, and then the mobility or parking people with their, um, we, who live in uh, work with, with their tools. Um, does that work well together? Is there an, uh, uh, I, is, how does that work for you as a professional? It's a bit of a yeah, strange you question mean, maybe, you but. You uh, mean the measurement yeah. of, of uh, people uh, doing their own measurements? On yeah, indeed. And also because you, of course you, this is now a mobility measure that comes from the, the drawing desk of environmental, uh, the, the environmental department. We also see that with, with access regulations with low emission zones, for instance, which have a mobility impact. Um, how how does that sit with the the transport uh, people and the the or is or do they work together well? Well, <laughs> it it could be better. It could be better. Uh, okay. So, um, well, we we're working together with the transport side that um, they have their own um, traffic and transport models, and um, they modeled for us the impacts of uh, parking management and traffic, and they gave these models back to to the uh, department for environment, and then afterwards with the results on traffic. Um, uh, we modeled the impacts on air quality, but as you asked the um, about the um, uh, measurements of of people doing their own measurements on air quality, um, right now there's not really a, a linkage between the professional um, um, measurement of air quality in Berlin and the measurements of, of people um, measuring on their own the air quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. There's very interesting comments in the chat. I'm not going to read them aloud, but French, uh, French law allows for, for uh, environmental differentiation uh, of, of charging. Uh, but then the question is, is it taken up by local authorities? Uh, and there's also an issue of, of accessing the, the databases that have these uh, characteristics. And a, a, an interesting prompt from Dirk also, who says, uh, if you only target visit, uh, if you only target residents, uh, the visitors still keep coming with their big, big vehicles. So that's an, uh, an issue. But I want to move yeah. to the, the last uh, and not least speaker, Benjamin Clark. Um, who got up very early for us um, in beautiful uh, Portland or Oregon. Um, and Benjamin, I uh, let you share your screen uh, and uh, the floor is yours.
thank you all very much uh, for having me here today. Um, so coming from the west coast of the United States, uh, covered in smoke uh, with wildfires right now, but uh, we're getting by. Um, so what I wanted to talk about um, is looking at the relationship between ride hailing um, and parking demand and revenues. Now we're working on several different iterations of this particular uh, piece of research and um, but this particular is looking at, at the revenue side. And so um, I come from someone with a background in finance and, and budgeting. So I got pulled into that. Uh, and I've worked on this project with my uh, colleague at the University of Oregon, Ann Brown, who couldn't be with us uh, this morning. Um, so uh, let's see, um, this project just as a uh, uh, acknowledgement of the funding that we've received for the project uh, comes from the National Institutes of Transportation and Communities and the Urbanism Next uh, Research Center at the University of Oregon, which I've learned is opening up a uh, a, a branch, so to speak, in, in Europe there. So uh, we'll be able to do some more collaborative work in the future. Um, so the sort of the, the motivation behind what we were looking at is how companies like Uber and Lyft and, and others uh, as ride hailing companies um, understand how they could potentially be used as a model for understanding what our future with autonomous vehicles might look like. Um, in particular, looking at how it might impact city revenues. Um, and just sort of as a, a visual of uh, the growth of ride hailing and specifically in the, the city that we study, which is Seattle, Washington, uh, again on the west coast of the United States, uh, looking at the month over month um, average growth in ridership since they began services um, there. Uh, both Uber and Lyft wouldn't let us actually show you the number of rides and they shared the data with us so we, we can show you the percentage of growth, which is pretty, uh, pretty dramatic, um, you know, 35% uh, in 2012. Um, and then in our most recent year of data, um, it, looking at about 4.8% each month of growth. So that's not like over the year, but each month, the increase uh, going that much. Now, this is, again, caveat pre uh, COVID-19. Um, so obviously, things have changed a little bit. Um, and again, sort of this motivation of, you know, what can we learn from ride hailing that might tell us about uh, autonomous vehicles? Um, again, sort of assuming that, uh, you know, using ride hailing uh, is very similar to what we might expect with, with autonomous vehicles. It just so happens that a Uber autonomous vehicle today has a driver in it. Uh, one of the biggest questions facing cities is uh, what to do with one of their largest land uses and assets. Um, and something that many have millions of dollars of, of municipal bonding um, invested into, which is parking. Now, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence from large uh, parking generating uh, locations or neighborhoods uh, that they're already seeing falling parking revenue as a result of ride hailing. Uh, particularly places like uh, airports or um, nightlife districts. Um, the, the challenges for cities, because you know, it, it, it could be a, a financial challenge that they couldn't repay some loans, particularly for those large parking garages that they've invested in. Um, and perhaps they need to start rethinking you know, parking supply in the, in the long run. So um, our, again, our sort of primary question is what's the link between ride hailing um, and in a neighborhood uh, and, and parking revenue. So sort of the context and methods of our, um, our particular uh, project here, uh, just in case you're not familiar with uh, United States geography, we're you know, complex, but Seattle um, is located up here. I'm down here um, in, in, in Oregon. Um, but, uh, and then we can look more specifically at the city of Seattle itself. There's different zones within the city and they charge different rates and very similar to probably many cities in, in Europe as well. Um, what we're trying to assess uh, in our, um, our study is looking at, you know, on this particular map, you see lots of these little blue lines. Those are streets where paid parking um, on the street, which is run by the city. So when we're talking about um, the, the, uh, the implications for municipal, local government finances, we're looking at where they generate their revenue. Now the city of Seattle itself doesn't have parking garages, but many cities 
uh, do. Um, parking, how we're measuring this in the study, just to give you a little bit of context as I start talking about numbers. Um, the amount of data we had to use in this study is uh, very, very large and competent, computationally difficult to handle uh, because we have so, so much data. It's about half of a terabyte, uh, just to kind of give you a little context there. So it was very hard for us to, to deal with it initially. Um, so we look at um, neighborhood level observations and group them together um, uh, by a day of week within a month. So all Mondays in the morning in a January of a particular year and then afternoons and evenings. Um, I'll refer to something called a census tract, which is a US government sort of term for a, for a neighborhood. Um, but that's just so in, as you're listening to me talk, if I refer to a tract, that simply is talking about a particular neighborhood that is assigned a number by the United States government. Uh, we have data from 2013 to 16 for the ride hailing companies and parking revenue occupancy um, and the average cost per hour. And those were all generated through either data we got from the city of Seattle or from uh, Uber and Lyft themselves. Uh, we also look at neighborhood characteristics, trying to control for different things going on there. Um, the average cost of, um, of gasoline um, as well, controlling for, for those. Um, and I already mentioned sort of this, this unit of an analysis, if you want to go back to it later on, uh, presentation will be provided um, then. Uh, again, I don't want to get too bogged down in the methods. I don't think that's really the, the intent here. I've made this presentation for academics who like to geek out um, on some of the statistical methods. Uh, but just generally speaking, we're using Poisson regression models and happy to talk about that later, but I don't want to spend too much uh, time on that. Uh, but just sort of as a, as a a larger note is um, we're looking at the, the total revenue generated in a, never, in a neighborhood and then secondarily the total revenue generated per parking place uh, within that neighborhood. So two different uh, measures of revenue, uh, just trying to see if those might turn out a little bit differently. Um, so I'm just going to kind of show the, the visual representations of the results, again, rather than um, spending too much time on a regression table. Um, again, not thinking that most of y'all are, are particularly interested in that kind of uh, thing. So I've pulled out uh, for our measure of total revenue generated within a neighborhood within one of our, our observations, uh, these four different charts here. And so what you're, you're seeing in, in these particular charts um, is by time of day. So we have morning, afternoon, uh, evening, and then all of the observations for the day combined. Um, and so uh, we've got a couple of vertical lines. Uh, these represent either the, the mean value in our last year of, of uh, uh, the arrows are off a little bit, but uh, the mean value or the maximum observed value. Um, and, and this is sort of what we're trying to get, <clears throat> excuse me, get across with this is that what we're observing today, um, sort of on, on average or what we, in the last year of data we had um, in, in this line, this is sort of, sort of our mean value and this is the most we ever observed, but we wanted to forecast out um, farther into the future when autonomous vehicles are much more common and potentially, you know, we have fewer personally owned vehicles. Um, and so as we move along the x-axis, we're increasing the number of TNC or, or ride hailing trips. And then uh, along our y-axis, we're looking at um, the, our revenues in dollars. Um, and so what we're seeing is, is the current trajectory is upward trajectory still, right? We're still expecting in, in the current era, uh, in the short and medium term, that revenues will continue to rise uh, for parking generation. But uh, not in the not too distant future, as we're seeing sometimes we're uh, already, uh, we're at about the, the peak of, of revenue, say for the morning, right? We're not gonna get much more revenue. If we look at this from the all day perspective, we're, we're very close uh, to our peak revenue. Uh, it's not that far off. And so this just sorts to help us understand a little bit when we're looking at the relationship between the number of ride hailing trips um, and the revenue generated, uh, we're not too far from, from peak parking revenue, uh, assuming we don't change anything within the, the overall model. Um, so 
we uh, at the meeting at our 2016 mean we're generating this much revenue um, again once we get over to our maximum observed value, again, that's only 73 more dollars, about 1.3% uh, higher than, than what we saw in our, our average. Um, but if we project out to say 30,000 trips, which is quite a bit more than what we have right now, we're gonna see about a 50% drop, again, assuming no change in policy, which is probably unrealistic. Um, just kind of moving forward, because it's a bit repetitive, um, we're gonna look at revenue per space. Again, these graphics look very similar to what we saw uh, before. So again, sort of trying to understand these relationships, they, they look very similar, whether they're measuring it as total revenue in a neighborhood or on a per space uh, basis. Um, I just want to, again, kind of skip over some of this because again, the results are, are very similar. Happy to discuss them in, in more detail, but I don't want to uh, spend too much more time. Uh, but again, pretty dramatic uh, drop in revenue, assuming no policy change. Um, over time, but we would see, again, projecting out pretty dramatic drops in revenue. So this can be um, very problematic for cities, as, as you all understand. Um, in a city like Seattle, uh, their, their general revenue fund uh, relies on, on parking revenues for about 3% of their total revenue. So losing 3% isn't huge, or maybe losing, uh, you know, a good share of that isn't a, a huge, huge hit to it, but it's certainly something that the city would have to address um, in the in the in the long term, uh, if not before then. Uh, there, we're expecting it to peak at about half of the current maximum level, right? So, but that's above where we are uh, on on average. Now, the effects of of right hailing are very different depending on what neighborhood you hit. And so, these images, if you're not familiar with the city of Seattle, represent different different parts of the city. Uh, but each neighborhood sort of has its own demand uh, curve um, for parking because they have different uses uh, of, of parking and, and different uh, periods of time when they might um, uh, generate more, more visits. Um, and the number of trips um, as, it, as it relates to uh, the total parking revenue depend, you know, what we're trying to show in this particular one is depending on what level of uh, of trips that occur, we're going to see sort of different shifts in that curve toward, towards revenue. Uh, the full report is available uh, through the link that, um, that uh, is provided on the website for the, the webinar. Um, and again, we'll, we'll provide some more details in there about you know, how we came to these particular conclusions. But I think perhaps what's, what's more important, kind of listening to the rest of the discussion that's been had here this morning, is sort of what's next for cities. Um, and the, the idea of managing for uh, parking for occupancy, which is uh, the city of Seattle's policy, uh, trying to maintain a rate uh, between 70 and 85%, which is the goal that city ha the city of Seattle has for each one of its parking districts, um, is going to result without question in lower revenue in the future, because if they want to maintain a certain level of, of occupancy, um, the demand for that parking is likely to go down. And so that means they're going to have to lower their price to induce demand to that. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's going to reduce their, their revenue. In the near term, um, and really in the current or even higher uh, ride hailing use, don't expect parking revenues to fall, right? So it's, this is something we need to plan for, right? And again, that's been the discussion I think uh, that's happened so far so today. Uh, but in the long run, revenue is going to decline without any really substantive uh, policy change. And, and what Ann and I have talked about a lot, and we've talked about this with the Urbanism Next uh, group uh, at its extent, uh, is that policy, policy should be at uh, the, the heart of of this discussion and that we need to have the policy leading the change rather than just sort of reacting to the environment as we've done in the past. Um, and that this is a great opportunity for cities uh, to reshape the public right of ways for new and different uses. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually given a lot of United States cities an opportunity to experiment with different uses. Um, and uh, but but with that is our sort of caveat that we really don't know uh, how the pandemic will change our habits uh, in the future. Uh, but what we've seen in numerous different cities around around the country is that some parking lots have been turned into drive-in movie theaters, 
Uh, some parking lots have been changed to uh, food pickup locations for um, either services that are delivering groceries or people coming to that location to pick up groceries instead of going into the store, they're ordering them online. Um, On-street parking has been turned into alfresco dining options where in the past some of these cities haven't even thought about the idea of eating on a sidewalk, which may be very common um, in many European cities, but in a lot of, at least in the northern part of the United States, uh, much of the year they've just uh, exclusively been inside and the sidewalk areas exclusively for walking and not for, for dining, and so that's changing some. Uh, streets have been closed to allow for more um, socially distanced walking and biking options uh, during the pandemic um, and freeing up some of that space that might have otherwise been used for either parking or, or active uh, motor vehicle usage uh, is now opened uh, in, in a different way. And so, you know, how much of this sticks in the future? How much of the uh, change in the hesitancy to use public transportation in the future might affect some of this? Uh, obviously remains to be seen. Um, so that's sort of uh, the, the short and dirty version of it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, get stuck in a discussion of methods or, or regression tables here, but again, happy to talk a bit more about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I, I have a question. Uh, do you, could you, you focused on, on right, Haley? Is yep. any modal shift measure uh, will any modal shift measure have similar uh, peak parking yeah, so uh, what, effects or, or is it not fully? Uh, so, yeah, um, so what we've seen uh, now Seattle out of most every other city in the United States actually has seen an increase over the period of our study in the use of public transportation. Um, so they're a little bit different. Um, but when we model this, uh, including the, the density of our public transportation network, um, that increase in the number of rides taken on, on, or the increase in the density of the public transportation network does decrease our, um, our parking occupancy and parking revenue, right? So there, there is an interrelationship and that's controlling for the number of rides taken on ride hailing. So as we try and work in the different modes of transportation. I think, you know, one of the challenges we have is that finding good data on, you know, the number of people that are using public transportation um, and the number of people using uh, ride hailing and the number of people that are driving in their own personal vehicles is hard to come up with. Um, so that's, that's posed, I think, one of our largest challenges um, because of the, the heterogeneity of, of the data environment that we work in. Okay, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, I'm looking at the time and I did not do well as a timekeeper, but I think we had very good uh, presentations that I also wanted to uh, to keep in their, their value. Um, I think uh, why we specifically invited you, Benjamin, is also because in, in Europe we have a discussion on earmarking of parking revenue, um, which, uh, which means that it's um, uh, that any threat of, of reduced revenue becomes a problem in the long term uh, when the parking revenues are feeding back to sustainable urban mobility solutions. Um, and also, I think, yeah, we, we, we really need to keep an eye on the, on the, uh, on the revenue. I think that's really an important, uh, important message. Uh, and thank you for, for bringing that to, to us. Um, I give the floor to Patrick, to uh, give a couple of observations from the side of uh, Park for Sump. Thank you, Ivo. Uh, do you all hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. I don't have a presentation, but I try to wrap up today's session, and I'm delighted to have been asked for this. Uh, so, to shortly introduce myself, uh, I'm a project leader at Mobile 21. We are a non-for-profit organization, mobility organization based in Leuven, Belgium, and I'm also the coordinator of uh, what uh, Ivo already presented: the Horizon 2020 Park for Some project. 
This is a project which is working in this very area of bringing parking research and innovation into local action, especially what we were looking at today and uh, talking about full integration of parking policies into a holistic, uh, sustainable urban mobility strategy in the future. So making parking a game changer for uh, urban mobility is more or less our park for some credo. And I must say, I have heard much similar today. Uh, when changing the parking fundamentals, this was the topic of uh, this webinar, we can help to free up valuable public space. It can make our cities more attractive and support local economy, I think. We noticed that from the presentation from Martina on the standards, but also on the one from Hervé uh, Lefebvre, Lefebvre uh, of Paris, when he was talking about the curbside management. And I heard, I remember his uh, uh, ambitious objective to reduce 60,000 on-street uh, car parkings uh, in Paris. And I'm happy also to hear about the outcomes of the participatory approach they will apply soon. But um, also other benefits uh, might happen when changing parking fundamentals. I think about reducing vehicle traffic, traffic and congestion that can help combat air pollution and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this is what we especially uh, we can remember from the Berlin uh, presentation by Benjamin when he was talking about parking management as part of their new uh, push and pull approach. And uh, at the other hand, and, and this is where I want to wrap up a little bit, uh, I think also other societal evolutions and services affect parking. And this is what we heard from uh, Benjamin Clark's uh, presentation, uh, especially when looking at uh, changing travel uh, patterns due to uh, ride hailing or due to COVID-19 or in the future maybe also when automated uh, vehicles are driving all along our future cities. And what you mentioned, uh, um, Ivo, is very um, interesting that when talking about um, declining revenues, we should see this also in the perspective uh, of uh, earmarking uh, of parking uh, revenues and having them um, brought into sustainable uh, alternatives uh, in our European SUMPs. I would like to end with uh, some promotion for Park for Some, as I may. Um, Ivo told in the beginning that uh, Park for Some has um, developed an audit tool. And this uh, audit tool, um, ParkPet means Parking Policy Audit, is uh, an instrument, instrument uh, enabling cities and municipalities to evaluate and to improve the quality of their local parking policy. And we intend to do this in a participatory process with all the stakeholders involved. And this is uh, sometimes uh, a tricky thing that um, uh, municipalities or cities Phase. We heard it also in, in the example of uh, Paris, but uh, this park for to, uh, park pet tool has been tested now in uh, park for some among the 16 cities we have, and in the next months. Uh, we will promoting this tool among other cities and the first time we will do this is on the 2nd of October during uh, urban mobility days session we organize a training but also in the next year we will be uh, present at the ipa conference in uh, brussels and here with i want to end this wrap up of uh, the session uh, i hope it was clear thank you yes thank you very much um 
Patrick, uh, we'll also share the details of the session during the Urban Mobility Days with uh, the participants. We'll, uh, um, we'll uh, send that link also with the, the wrap-up of the webinar. Um, that leads me to one final message. Eh? So the series continues. There is more um, next week where we focus on inclusive mobility with uh, uh, projects such as Inclusion and High Reach, which have their final conference, and also uh, where we introduce the successors of these projects um, with Indemo, Trips, and Dignity. Um, we also will send you the outcomes of this webinar with a specific focus on the chat. I copied all the uh, info that you have shared and we'll also uh, dispatch a number of questions that are still unanswered uh, to the speakers um, so that they can also um, answer and, and we'll also add that to an, a short report uh, because I thought that uh, I, I thought the, the chat was really uh, interesting. Um, I think all the presentations point towards this uh, peak peak parking concept that we have to explore further, um, either induced by policy or uh, induced by new mobility services that enter the market. Um, and it's a topic that we'll, we'll definitely keep on the agenda. So I would like to thank the speakers again and thank you also for participating and being a very um, interactive and very active audience. And bye and speak to you soon. <laughs>